Hello and welcome uh, to the Sonic Talk special. We're very fortunate today to be able to talk to uh, Miss Imogen Heap, who's there in her London studio. Is this Hideaway Studios? This is the Hideaway Studios. Oh, wow. In the past, it's been in Bermondsey. That's when I made Speak for Yourself, and it was in um, a place called Atomic Studios. And I, had, I, I rented one of the places there, which was next to a carpet factory, um, which was good because I could use the carpet tubes as some of the music making sounds oh god yeah they sang fantastic carpet tubes when you hit them with uh it's um uh table flat. tennis bats isn't it all the flat of your hand yeah yeah you've been, you've basically just come back from tour in the states i mean that's that's where where you've been doing some dates with uh, guy and um you know promoting the, the new material i mean you you famously it's like one song guitar song so is that the beginning of of, of a new of a new set of uh, material you're going to be doing do you think I don't think so, no. <laughs> it's just kind of a song that we love. And as we were going to go on this tour together, we thought we'd release something nice. Um, but it's not its not the beginning of something right now, that's for right. sure. But Guy and I just kind of famously don't really discuss it. Uh, we, we spend a lot of time with each other on tour, but we just don't really talk about it. Because we know that, as with Fru Fru, it was never a, a decision that we made. It was just something that out of happenstance we were both having difficulties with our labels at the time and we were both in London and it was just the right time right time right place and we began this thing which turned out to be free free it was never a, like we're going to do a duo act and do that for a few years um it just happened very naturally so we're both deeply in love with each other's work and deeply respect each other as musicians and enjoy the process for me I, I know that it's an intense process <laughs> and I want to make sure that I have a good headspace for that and so I can really be there you know with an open heart um, so there's no plans as yet because we're doing lots of things in heap camp which is keeping me busy and so I imagine it is on the horizon at some point Oh, OK. All right. Well, thanks for clearing that up. I mean, so how, and how are you on tour? What's, I mean, when I saw, because I saw the tiny desk thing that you did uh, and I, I thought it was really very informal, just sort of great. And everything I've seen that, of you on stage seems very relaxed and kind of, you know, just sort of just projection of you without having, you, you, there doesn't seem to be an on you, you know, where you kind of become this showbiz monster, you know. Uh, how, I mean, how do you find touring? I mean, I mean, it must be harder now with family and whatnot, but uh, do you love it? Um, I do love it. I do love it. I liked it. I like it now for different reasons. I enjoyed it before because it was like, you know, I went on tour with one of your um, one of your person that you interviewed, Tim Exile, once, and that was just great fun. You know, we had great fun each night. We got a bit drunk every night, and we did the kind of we're on tour thing. But obviously, if you have a child and a family with you, life's a bit different, but in a in a magical way too, where you manage to connect and combine if you're really lucky everything that you do and it kind of one flows into the next flows into the next and it's not this kind of clunky thing here that's tour and then you come off tour and then this thing um so life carries on really on tour and we have um you know we have the show we have our workshops that we do to bring music makers together and services together to discuss a future music ecosystem and then we're taking the gloves with us so sometimes we do university talks or demos around that and we reach out to as many universities as possible to do talks there too um, and then I'm also you know very thankful to some of the fans who paid a little bit extra up front to help us get this all going and so we do our little enabler acoustic shows which is very spontaneous and they basically ask whatever question and whatever song they like and then I do my best to fulfill their wishes um, and it's sometimes in a beautiful theatre sometimes it's in a cafe sometimes it's all kinds of random places and sometimes there's you know two people or even one person we had I think it was in Czech Republic or somewhere else somewhere there was just one person who paid the fight you know 150 pounds I think it was for this extra thing and the show and everything wow um so yeah it's been it's been really fun it has been fun but i did get very tired um i did get very tired and there is with a child you know your focus is is she happy you know are we yeah. are we able to give her and be present for her whenever we're around her and make sure that you know i'm there enough that I, and not just enough not that it's like okay okay now i can go see scout um but just really plan it so that it feels easy it feels flowy and it feels exciting 
it's really, I mean, I can speak, you know, I mean, obviously I'm not a mum, but I've been a dad at, with a small yeah. child and the creative, the creative world and the creative mind and children are very incompatible in lots of ways because with creativity, you know, sometimes it happens, you sort of have to put the hours in, don't you, to wait for the muse to strike. I mean, do you find yeah. that you're able to still be as creative or you, do you become more sort of focused, kind of like, well, I've got this morning, I better come up with something. I mean, how do you yeah. find that kind of process? Um, I'm creative in in lots of other ways, maybe not in the traditional, like, I've come into the studio to make music, because that is something you need to oil. It's something that you need to keep keep going. I, I like to think that, oh, yeah, you know, after a year of not making music, it's just going to pop out. But actually, it's not just... If I was sitting at piano and I just had to record a song playing the piano, then it would just pop out. But because the way that I... The way that I want to make a, a produced piece of music involves... You know, getting my head into the um, into the plugins again, getting my head into the kit and into the the gear and all that stuff. That takes quite a while to kind of whoosh, just focus in on that. So I haven't been very good at that, that's for sure. <laughs> and in many ways, I've just put it on hold for a long time. For I got basically had a child, had Scout about four and a half or nearly five years ago, and she obviously changed my life, changed our lives. Um, and within that space where I would normally come into the studio and be doing stuff or going on tour or whatever I was doing, um, I went into my head and I went into imagining how I would like my life to be easier. <laughs> um, and, and that is what inspired this next phase of my life, which was around how can we simplify, mainly admin actually for musicians in the music space, how can we simplify our songs, be able to pay us quickly and easily? How can we simplify the emails and the socials and everything that we have to deal with? How can we try to move towards a future where we don't have to have ab so much advertising and so much marketing that we can empower the songs to find people and people to find the songs without the need for all this noise everywhere? Um, so that all came from, you know, very late at night, breastfeeding scout, just not able to do anything really so my my head went off into this space what's what i find really interesting about this is because in many ways you know your career began you know the traditional record company route but for quite a short period of time before you sort of started to do things more in a more independent way so that's clear that you know that, that you've you've this has obviously been percolating for a long time and the music industry pretty much at, at the same time as your career has been in the ascendance the music industry sort of been in the descendants in its traditional form so it's mm. much harder, isn't it, for artists to 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 find a path uh, in to to a greater audience. I mean, it's it's yeah. in many ways it's easier for artists to become self sufficient from a niche point of view and sort of play a few tours and and get all of the revenue, little as there is. Yeah. But there's not much space for the other bigger stuff to happen around that. I mean, is that is that one of the reasons that this this kind of process started for you? That's one of the reasons. Um, I mean. Also, you know, bizarrely, one of the reasons that I have, I am able to do this is because I have had success. <laughs> so I don't have to go out and tour. You know, I've lost money on the last two tours because of we've been doing these workshops and we've been taking a slow tour um, way in, met also because of family, but also because we want to do these workshops, we want to reach out to universities. So it's been a very expensive route. We haven't made money on it. Um, but I've made, I've had success where people know what it is that I do and where I where I have my skills and passions so people know about my gestural music wear project with the Mimu team um these are my gloves yeah <laughs> um they know about that I'm interested in blockchain they know that I have a child so they know these kind of key points in my life and as a result of that it brings me work whether it's with cow and gate to make the happy song for um, music for under twos or whether it's to make a piece of music for Sennheiser or Dolby because I'm a music and a woman in tech or whether it's to go and invite me to give a talk at CERN you know in um, TED at CERN for instance which doesn't actually give me money but it all pushes into it grows know, the, this uh, the, well i hate to use the word brand but the the your your <laughs> it, your visibility shall we say yeah 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 and so it's that kind of understanding my tag words that are sitting around my head for people who know what i do um that are constantly out there uh, when they know who, who i am or what i do but for the 99.9 percent .9 of other people in the music 
business in the music industry, making music, whether you're a sound engineer, whether you're doing podcasts, whether, whatever it is, how do people know about you and how do people know what you do in order to offer you work? There is, you know, a level of, oh, you know who you know, and that gets you the next job. But when music is omnipresent and digital and 24 seven, we also need as musicians uh, and creators to be in that 24 seven available, all the data that you need around who we are to breathe life into those possibilities, those happy accidents. Welcome. Hey, Alexis. <laughs> coffee. Thank you, Lexi. This is also part of the secret of my success is coffee. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Um, it, I, I, yeah, I, to, I mean, it, it's really interesting because, I mean, you know, in some ways, you know, the, the old fashioned way of doing things, the record label, the management, all of those things would kind of would would mask all of that stuff from you. And, you know, if you were just a singer, you would sing and you would perform and you would do those things that were required of you. You didn't have to get involved in so much of the other stuff, whereas now it's it's at least half of the, if not more, I think. The actual making the stuff is almost, it, it, it's become less important, which is, is kind yeah. of weird. And we need to kind of get it back to a point where the music creation is the most, the thing that you spend the most time doing, because that's what you are, you know, that's what you should be doing um, if you want to be making music. You don't want to be figuring out how to be funny in the next tweet or how to make that music vi video viral or whatever you need to be doing these days to kind of get above the noise. You really need to be just honing in in your craft and, you know, reading and, you know, exploring the world and gathering and processing and being that, you know, being that, um, that voice to your thoughts and, and connecting. And it's very limited to do that when there's just so much, even just in the music space, but in the world right now, just bombarding like nonsense mm. coming into your, into your vision, into your ears. So anything that we can do to lessen the noise by empowering the content that we have, the music that we have, to find people and to find them for the reasons of maybe it's in a health app um, and maybe it's been verified as a really good running song by, you know, the, the community or maybe there's certain lyrics in it that were actually written about a certain event so when that certain event pops up again then the world knows whether you're a radio station or you're a um, or you're a playlist that that's a thing that you can you can play now because that relates to this type of maybe natural disaster or something like that right so it's being able to or somebody is interested in I mean I'm, I'm, I have a cup here <laughs> at one point so SE microphones going studio electronics microphone. Yeah, that's right. So perhaps um, some of my music, which I'm sure it has, has been recorded with these microphones. And so it might be that somebody's somebody's doing a bit of um, research into what microphones they could get and they could discover that, you know, these particular vocal tracks on these particular songs use this vocal mic combined with this. Uh, well, I mean, that, but that's an enormous amount of metadata that somebody has to type in somewhere. There's, so there's got to be a lot of admin in there, surely. Yeah, but it's only once. And what it does is it makes a hundred new connections to you that you wouldn't normally have outside of Imogen Heap, Electronic, that's it. Um, and, you know, maybe a front cover, but going Imogen Heap, Electronic, Avalon 737, Neumann TLM 103, um, you know, right. Pro Tools, uh, you know, all these other kinds of ways that can pull people in, in whatever kind of discovery routes they're doing. And potentially they could even be monetizable. So it could be little ways to, you know, say SE microphones or Toy Neumann or, Avalon were interested in um, if there was a way in the future of the Internet of Things and everything was super connected, um, that you you did actually lead uh, somebody to buy an Avalon 737 because they clicked on all these musicians. They clicked on, oh, Imogen used that on her all of her records. I'm going to go and buy that Avalon 737, that there could be even a cut in there in the future. Mm. So, Or that they could give us money to post you know that we did use that microphone on our song you know because then they wouldn't have to bother with advertising in the same way it would be very you know more attuned to the yeah kind of i see that... i see yeah that that does make a lot of sense it's kind of in some ways it's about the the, the kind of correct attribution and tagging um yeah. if i could just so is this about is this part of the mycelia um umbrella is this the kind of the, the shape of that yeah. is that right okay it's, it's the, the creative passport is what we've come down to, boiled it down to, that if we want a music ecosystem that supports the music maker, we need to be actually in a place of, um, you know, to be, to be able to be useful to the music industry by being, having a standardised set of uh, a, a place 
things that you might need to know, like your PRS information or your PPL number or your ASCAP number or all of these different identifiers that we have as musicians in the music um, recording space and composition space in one place so that people can get what they need when they need it. If, I don't know if you've ever tried to fill out a PPL form, but it's a complete yeah. nightmare. Um, and often it's not down to the musician that ends up doing that, it's down to the label, if you have a label. And therefore things can lead to problems. And so how do we become a verified, useful entity, individual entity, to be able to clean up the data problem in the music industry and beyond that to grow this next layer of metadata for discoverability? That sounds fascinating, actually. I mean, I, I, I can see what, what you're trying to do. I mean, it's a big, it, it, it seems like a very big vision, but actually all the information is kind of there. It's just a question of centralising it in the, in, in the right way and, and the sort of non-invasive and sort of benign way, I suppose. That's the thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So there's not, we're not actually want to do anything at the, the kind of service front-facing end. We just want to um, empower the music maker to have a place to put their data so that it, it, and, and our job is to go around and try to connect with every single entity over t in time or to in create enough incentive for the entities to want to come to us to connect to the our APIs so that we can share this data so that we have one login. So we don't like log into, oh my God, imagine if this just makes me just want to do this for, just for this reason. If we're talking about gear, imagine if you had one login that you just had on and you never had to type in your password, check your iLock, you know, check what number um, version you had in any of your any of your system. You just come into your studio. It's just it knows that you're there wherever you are in the world. If you've gone into somebody else's studio, but you're using your kit, you're, you want to go into a studio and have your stuff at your fingertips on somebody else's computer in terms of the software instead of having to like um, make sure they've they've got all the right plugins and this and that that right. you just go in and it you put you know it knows that you're there because your creative passport id is there in some way while you've flashed it over something on the computer screen a qr code or whatever and then it goes oh yeah imogen it's got all my things that there's your stuff or it's got everything um and i never have to remember a password ever again i never have to <laughs> any kind of email logins or I've just got this one point which belongs to me and I can manage things from this point. Um, and then beyond that, you know, it wouldn't be like if somebody was to look for somebody for some music, for some a sync or a talk or a private concert or any of that stuff, the Creative Passport itself wouldn't be finding those for you. It would just be delivering the data out to services who are trying to reach those, right. you know, um, talk people who are looking for speakers connecting with musicians who are available to be spoken with so that would be a, a service and that as a creative passport holder you would sign up for oh yeah I, I want to do talks when my calendar allows it so this service gets access to your specific calendar information around when you're free to do a talk within a certain radius of a certain day so it's just basically like your personal assistant stroke manager stroke data manager really um so that you can interface with the world at the speed of which music interfaces with everyone else. That's a really, that's a great, a, a grand concept. And it seems very doable as well. Um, perhaps if I could rewind a little bit, because obviously, you know, you when you started out in music, you traditional route, it's, you know, uh, uh, what was it? Piano and uh, clarinet, was it? And cello, was that, am I correct here? I've done some research. Now you've got some, <laughs> you've, you, do you still, do you still play? Ah, oh, look at There they are. Ah, oh, the old things that I used to play. Um, so, so I don't you, really but play. Music, then music technology has figured. So, you know, you taught yourself because you discovered that you needed to know the stuff to be able to make music. I mean, music technology has been a really big part of your career trajectory and your creative process. I mean, do you have? What's your relationship with it like? I mean, do you find now it's it's something you love, or do you kind of tire of the complexity of it? Um, I, I want to do anything I can to simplify the complexity because ultimately I love what it can do to me as a musician to augment myself and you know make that really long reverb or to chop myself up to the milliseconds and create some crazy jump pattern or out of my voice or whatever it might be. I love working with computers. What I don't love is how it forces me into a physical place of having to sit here you know in front of my computer for hours on end each day when I have this you know body like everyone else that you know can get up and do things and um it kind of so i'm looking forward to that 
that point in time where humans switch into gestural interfacing with their technology. And I heard recently about Elon Musk. Yeah, I was just going to say. Yeah. Brain, uh, Are you going to sign up for that? <laughs> well, maybe. Maybe I'll Ethan, let that guy go Ethernet first. Jack. <laughs> Ethernet Jack on the back of the head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, no, don't talk to me about Ethernet. I had nightmares with Ethernet on stage. So definitely not Ethernet. Um, but yeah, I, I'm definitely more in the camp of... Um, I. It's true, this, you know, I mean, I'm very basic skimming on the edges of what I know about Elon Musk. Um, I'm not anti-AI, but I'm also pro-human. So Mm. the idea that we can augment ourselves um, to the point where our brains get, you know, enable us to to work at the speed of which the world is working, to help us us manage information, um, to help us navigate the world that we are starting to live in. Because it, it, I think that we're, it, so much of our lives, if we live in this 24 seven world, um, so much of our headspace goes into just this, just this constant reflux, reflex, 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 that we don't really yeah. need to do anymore. Well, I mean, there's, uh, a, da- there's a danger that parts of our, 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 our old brain will atrophy because we don't use them anymore if we if we end up with that and that's that that would be a bit scary i think the thought i sp- or is that just human development i don't know it's a big think, question well there's a bit isn't there like loads of our brain that we haven't we don't know how to use it <laughs> like the capacity of our brain aren't we like 80 percent or something or 20 percent or i don't know but isn't there yeah. like loads of extra room for improvement um up here um so maybe we can just like <laughs> Maybe there's little chips that help us figure out how to activate and, you know, learn new ways of thinking. Um, so yeah, that we don't that's kind of drugs, isn't it? Isn't that a sort of, isn't that a psychoactive <laughs> kind of... <laughs> yeah, but I wouldn't drive a car on drugs, you know. So. No, that's true. So uh, was there a light bulb moment when you just thought, I've got to have me a synthesizer or I've got to have, you know, the, the computer? What Was there a point where, where you sort of made the synaptic jump from this kind mm. of physical physical playing of an instrument to the, the electronic and the, and the technology world? Yeah, there was. Um, and it was when I was 12 and I went to, um, I went to a boarding school. Um, I lived in this house, actually, um, until, I was, until I was 12. And then my parents split up and then it all got a bit awkward. So um, for whatever reason, we went to boarding school. And it was, yeah, it wasn't the most fun I've ever had in the first year, um, but I survived it. And, but in that period, I discovered that, um, that well, they had this amazing music school. Um, it, was a, it was a boarding school called Saffron, in Friends School, Saffron Morgan. I don't know if it's still there, actually. I think it got turned into flats recently. Um, but it had a whole area where it had uh, a whole building of like 20 pianos. Um, wow. just piano, piano after piano. And I was like, I, I want to come. And I think they probably figured that out because they knew I love playing the piano. So I was like, as long as there's pianos, I don't mind. And I got to play the piano for hours on end, you know, instead of sitting around trying to avoid being bullied. Um, and then when I was there, one of the rooms had an Atari computer. And I was like, I wonder what that does, you know, that secret room that's locked away. And so, yeah, I very early on just asked my music teacher and said, what's that in there? Um, and can I have a go? And he's like, oh, don't we really know how to use it? But OK. Um, and so I started to read this ginormous manual um, and started to figure out that I didn't have to write things out on manuscript paper anymore to be able to go there. There's an idea. Could you please play that? Maybe one day mm. school orchestra, if there, was a, there wasn't a school orchestra. But, you know, when would you ever get anything played by someone? Um, because I did know how to write you know, scores, um, and I I had done a bit of that in theory, and I was really interested in that. Um, But there was no way to hear it back, so I could play it on a keyboard, and I I could, it sounded rubbish, the sounds that they had, it was like general MIDI, awful, horrible sounds. Um, But at least I could hear all these different layers, one after the other, and that was enough. I was just like, I am there, I love this, that I can sit in here for hours on end and create these these drum loops and, you know, play drums. I couldn't play the drums. Um, and just type in these things with a keyboard and I could make any sound I want and it would play it back to me. And then I could record it. I can't even remember how I record it. Probably onto a DAT, maybe. Maybe it was too early for DAT. I don't know. No, it must have been a DAT. Would it have been a DAT or a cassette? Could recorder? have been a DAT or maybe a four track or maybe that, you know, that multi-track recorder. A DAT possibly? Maybe. It would have been in like 1985. No, okay. no, sorry. 1989. Yeah, that could be ADAT. I think ADAT's been around about I don't, 
I think yeah. I think it was probably just a cassette recorder like in the room play out of the speakers type thing. <laughs> um or maybe they had definitely had floppy disks. Um yeah. Anyway, so that was yes, that was the moment where I was like, I'm in. I love this thing. And um and beyond obviously you couldn't record real audio in there. Um so that's when I I didn't even I did sing, but I didn't really sing and to like go oh, look look at my songs. It was more yeah. It just instrumentation I got really excited and then I went to the Brit school and that's where I learned about um, you know tape to tape and recording with mixing desks and microphones and my voice and production and all that kind of thing so Brit I'm school of course is very fa I mean it, it seems to it, it seems to have a very high success rate of people who go there so they're obviously <laughs> doing something right whether it you know I mean in, in pop culture I mean and also yeah. you know in, in art culture too because I mean you're a living proof that it works outside of just the sort of route one number one song type yeah. of approach yeah I think I mean I kind of rolled my eyeballs then but I didn't mean that I just meant that um, what happens is a lot of people who are just desperate to make music and know that they want that in their lives. There are not many places that you can go and do A-levels or GCSEs that really focus on that. Mm. And there's, at the time, there was only one. There was only the Brit School. And so I could still do my A-levels, but I could focus on recording or, you know, recording and engineering, which I couldn't do anywhere else. So it does have a high success rate, but it's also got, it's, it's the place that kind of magnet, it's the magnet to all the people like me out there, young, who just want to do music that maybe a bit been successful anyway um or maybe not anyway but it was a uh, in the beginning it was um i don't think they would mind me saying it was a bit of a mess it was like two years in i was there in the second year and they had no idea really what they were doing it was a it was a bit of a mess but it was great for us because we had amazing equipment we had a whole studio that i could use i used it you know pretty much every evening and um and we had these little uh early mac kind of little square mac yeah the mac classics yeah yeah that we used logic in and there were like 15 or 10 or 15 stations of those and it was the first time that i ever met anyone who made music with a computer um as well so they were like you know we were doing it in class it was like this is heaven yeah that i, I get imagine. to learn about all this stuff with all these other kids um but the real for there the great thing there was this teacher who was called gary hayes and he was my music technology teacher, and he just really inspired me to, you know, further explore um, production in the studio and see what these things did and how you record stuff and what a mixing desk was, which just said like a load of buttons and weird stuff to me. Um, but then I was like, oh, actually, one channel is just exactly the same as all the other channels. So as long as I get one channel right, then I can kind of figure out the rest of it. Um, so I really loved, I really loved that. And if, but if it wasn't for him, and he didn't have that nurturing with that one teacher um it may have been a different story but i mean because you know i don't think everybody knows i mean as well as being a, a, an artist you're a proficient and and rewarded and awarded and accredited engineer producer as well i mean that's that's another part of what you do right it is but i'm not i feel a bit like a fraud um don't, because, we, don't we all <laughs> yeah um because you know, i'm looking at this lovely mixing desk that i have this lovely you know 5088 that rupert neve um uh, design thing and it's very beautiful but I'm, I haven't actually actually used it at all I bought it a year ago and my plan was to you know redo this studio so I didn't have this big um, digital icon desk which I had which I never ever used I used it because I was like I bought it because I was like that's gonna look like a proper studio in my basement and when interviewers come over and go oh yes we're going to talk to Imogen about singing they'll go oh wait a minute maybe we'll talk to her about engineering as well right. um, so I, but I realized that I just never used it because it was much quicker to do things in the computer than to reach over and turn a thing. You could just do it really quickly inside the computer. Um, so I bought this analog desk because it's beautiful and it sounds gorgeous, but I haven't actually had any time to use it yet. <laughs> well, it's only so, the last year. So, I mean, that, that, that's, that's fine. I mean, I suppose... Fine. I suppose the thing about it is also is that you know when you're when you're working those I mean because the, the, there's a great blog post on your site imogenheap.com where you're talking about uh, the the collaboration with Taylor Swift, which is a great story and you seem to have had have have become a a, a a touch point for a lot of the kind of upcoming sort of young pop starlets who kind of want to aspire to the kind of level of creativity that you have, and she mm. you know she. You, you worked on that album and it was Grammy nominated and it, it sounds like a kind of match made in heaven. Oh, you got yeah. notifications coming in. Is that another reward? Delete my mail. Well, like, close it off anyway. 
Um, right, sorry, continue. <laughs> so, I mean, that that whole, because I've listened to the track and it, it it's it, it's great, but it's not mm -hmm. very, very Imogen Heap. You know, I'm kind of expecting this total sort of Imogen Heapness, but I suppose in some ways, do you find that collaboration and that, pr that production liberating because you don't have to be so much, you know, yourself and your pure, in your purest form? Yeah, that's really interesting you say that because I feel like every time I've worked on somebody else's music, I end up failing them because I just end up sounding like myself. So I'm really happy that you listen to it and you think it doesn't sound, you know, 100% Imogen Heap. Obviously, if you take away her vocals, that it still doesn't sound 100% Imogen Heap, that I've managed to, you know, I mean, Taylor was here in the studio and she was going, I like that, I don't like that, I like that, I don't like that. So she was producing it too, you know. I think a lot of people don't credit the artist for production when actually a lot of the time they are producing it because they're like no no yes no um they're not like the uber producer coming in and who knows how to do everything um but they they do often have you know a production say in their records but they're often not credited um so yeah i mean she taught me a lot about um about making records that day <laughs> she taught me a big lesson um well she probably read but it was there was one point where um we'd kind of we'd written or well, she'd written the she wrote the song I didn't write the song, um, even though she gave me a writing credit, which is very nice of her. Um, uh, yeah, but I think partly the reason is because in America, you don't get paid for uh, your performance money no, on the radio. A lot of people right. give publishing, which is very great, but in the UK, we never do that. We're like, no, you didn't write the song, therefore you're not getting any songwriting. Sure. Um, sure. So anyway, she was here writing the lyrics and, and I was kind of bringing the music to life here with her. I was obviously nervous because I was like, she's a huge star, you know, a bit, uh, a bit overwhelmed by her being here, trying to disguise it. And I think she was also trying to disguise it as well, because she was a bit like, oh my God, Imogen Heap. So we were all a bit, it was quite funny, but we didn't talk about it. Um, and so I was running around finding instruments that I thought she might like. And if she was like, um, or not going, yeah, I love that, then I would put it down. And if she liked it, I would just play more of it. Um, and then I went over there to the keyboard and uh, I was like, I think we should try something else in the middle section, something else, maybe some different chords. Um, and so I went over and I started playing stuff and she was like, yeah, I think we're gonna lose them at that point. <laughs> and I was like, hmm, that's why you sell millions of records and I don't. <laughs> so I came back and I was like, okay, what's another way to you know, change things up? And I just pulled everything out of the drums and gave it a bit of space. And that, that gave you know, the same effect that I was going for, which was just, let's change it up a bit. Um, so yeah, it was really enjoyable and it was very fast, really, really fast process. I do really love collaborating. I look forward to the next record, which, you know, keeps getting further and further back in time. Um, but that is my next focus is how to put together another record. And But I don't want to do another record of me just in the studio noodling around for hours on end, um, you know, deciding whether something's good or not to myself, going and having a cup of tea and trying to get some objectivity around it. Um, I want to uh, do an album of collaborating. Well, that so, sounds like a good plan. I mean, do, um, just going back to the creative process, I mean, because uh, a lot of your stuff is built on this kind of, it's almost like a looping approach of building layers and layers of vocals. I mean, obviously, there's much more complexity to that. I mean, is there, is there a fast bit and a slow bit to that process, or do you try and splurge and then go back to it and, and chop it all up? I mean, how, how does it work for you, or is it different every time? Hmm. Well, um, I don't really have a... Well, maybe I do. Maybe I do have a, a method. I'm not aware of it. Or maybe I have to... Um, kind of rediscover what it is every time and then I end up just repeating the same problems each. but I don't feel like I have a method because if I did I think I'd write loads more music um, <laughs> I feel like every time I'm just going how do I make music again every time I start a song what do I do oh yes I could play the piano okay I'll go upstairs play the piano I'll go oh it sounds a bit boring I'm, I'll, okay I'll go downstairs or maybe I'll just record the sounds of the leaves that's what I'll do um, and, but most of the time you know, in the last five, or the last kind of, the last projects that I've done, the last album that I've done, and the last few songs since then, have all been around specific limitations for mm. like a, a commission, you know, for Sennheiser, or one for Dolby, or one for Cowan Gate, or, um, you know, there's a new one coming up. And so I really, really love that. I love having that limitation because that's where I get super creative because then I don't have my own head to you've be got, annoyed you've about. Got, yeah, you've got. Um, so, because you did the uh, the, the award-winning winning again, the music to the Harry Potter musical, 
which is beautiful yeah. and really Thanks. rhythmically. I mean, I was listening to it and I was in some case I'm going, I can't figure out that time signature. What the hell's going on there? I mean, <laughs> that sounds like that sort of thing would have been great fun to do because again, I mean, there's a lot of heapness to it, but there's also a lot of outside of your general, you know, what one would expect yeah. from an image in heap record as well. Yeah. Yeah, I really loved doing that record. Um, I mean, there was the making the music for the play, which was one thing, a very different process. And then there was the making of the album, which was trying to make a hundred wow. cues of quite different music and times and tempos and key signatures um, to then turn that into a piece of music that was enjoyable outside of not right. having your sound effects and your dialogue and your lighting and all that stuff. So that was a real challenge. It took me... A, a, just it took me way more time than it did actually to make the music for the play um to do the album but i love i really really love what came out of it um and in many ways it doesn't sound like an image and heap album but in many ways i felt like i was expressing myself to my full because i was able to remove the self in many ways by removing my voice removing that bit of the ego bit um and freeing up not the voice because there's lots of voice but the lyric um because the minute you put a lyric on there it's like me 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 listen to me. well your lyrics are very personal as well so i mean kind of... <laughs> yeah but i mean just by by way of you being a human voice you kind yeah. of all the attention goes into the human voice so removing that and just having you know space to express my musicality um without my annoying voice getting in the way um or my lyrics it was really fun um so I hope I hope it leads to more things. Not right now because I haven't got any time. But in the future, I'd love to do a film score. Um, I think that you'd yeah. be so ideally suited to that. I mean, I can't imagine. Yeah, you know, I mean, because your music's been appropriated in a lot of uh, ways. You know, I mean, whether it's been sampled, but for you know, hide and seek, obviously the big one, which is, it, I guess, you know, it, is that the song that you think everybody probably knows me for just that, and then hopefully discovers the mm -hmm. rest of the stuff. There's certainly yeah. A large percentage of people have discovered it through that song, whether it's through the OC or through Saturday Night Live or through a meme that they didn't even know existed from an original, you know, uh, song or from Jason Derulo or from the Tiesto remix or, you know, there's so many different ways. It's or from a, a choir playing it in a school. Um, so many different ways people have discovered that song. It's really had the most incredible life and I'm extremely fortunate that it has because when I wrote it in the studio, I just thought, oh, this is very um, self-indulgent to just make a song with just vocals um, and, you know, one little weird sound effect that kind of, I felt like it being a bit lazy by just playing my voice through a harmonizer, but I really liked the sound and I was like, mm, but are people going to think that I'm being lazy because I'm just playing my, you know, voice through a harmonizer, not actually singing all those, all those harmonies. Um, but I just really loved it. But everyone who came into the studio early on was like, yeah, it's really good. Um, are you going to put any music to it? Oh, um, I mean, I, I'm so glad you didn't. Uh, I mean, it's, the thing is, for me, it's it, it's got visceral emotion in it. And it's because of, A, the vocal performance, but B, the, the choice of those harmonizer mm. chords. They're, they're, so, they're so dense. And so, mm -hmm. uh, and th there's something about it, like the, the fifths and the octaves that, you know, it resonates. It's almost like folk. You know, it's got that yeah. kind of, that thing. Um, yeah. But I have yeah, to ask you, because there's, there's the, the, the question always happens. What was the gear you used on that record, please? Okay, don't mind sharing that. Um, well, it was still this microphone. Ta -da, the TLM 103, because it's, it's probably that exact same microphone. Um, and this over here. Wait, there you go. So there's my... It's not. I will turn it on to prove that I do sometimes turn it on. The Avalon. Um, there it is. That, I love that. I, I've used it everywhere. Um, hello. Um so that's that's the teak desk so um what was i saying so i used those two um actually i probably didn't wait a minute no i probably didn't even do that i'll tell you why because um what happened i was in the studio and I, i've told this so many times and whenever somebody gives me a react to something that they thought was funny or interesting i i might embellish it over this so i can't actually exactly remember the <laughs> truth um but it was some the truth is somewhere in here um so late at night i was uh, recording in my studio near the carpet factory and um this is true the computer that i just bought my new mac like to great expense um had blown up so i'd only had it like two weeks and it literally frazzled um and oh. went pfft. and the motherboard i think um and the p puff of smoke out of literally the computer. wow 
literally. So I was like, uh, of course I hadn't saved anything because just hadn't learned that lesson yet. Um, and it was like really depressing. So I, I thought I was very angry with myself. Um, and I, but I didn't want to leave the studio with an angry vibe because I do believe that if you, the way you leave it is the way you come back to it. So I thought, okay, I'm going to do something positive before I leave. I'm going to plug in. I'm going to either, I'm going to play the piano and just improvise or, um, or I noticed something in sitting on top of a radiator that wasn't on, which was this Digitech workstation, um, little black box that I've probably got in a cupboard somewhere still, um, which had, uh, I think eight little faders, um, very small thing, um, that I'd borrowed off uh, a guy called James Towler, who was the technician for Steve Winwood. Um, and for some reason he gave it to me, he said, oh, you should try this. Um, you know, so really it should, all, everyone should thank Steve Winwood's tech, um, James Towler for giving me this harmonizer, um, to try out. And he just texted me that morning saying, um, I think Stevie wants to use that harmonizer. We need to get it back to him. I don't know, actually know if he asked him, so that was probably why. Um, so anyway, I thought, okay, uh, there it is. I'm going to have a quick go because otherwise I'm going to have to give it back and I won't ever know what it does. So I plugged it into, I knew how to do it. You plug it into, a, you know, your keyboard or whatever. Oh, you take MIDI, MIDI notes, back. right. Yeah, and then I plugged in a, probably an SM58 straight into the back of the, um, to the harmonizer, to be fair. Uh, I probably didn't do anything more than that because I was tired and annoyed. Um, and I just played in a few chords and just started singing whatever came into my head. And what came out was very similar to what, not lyrically, but structurally, chordally, um, space in between where I sang, so the breaths and the train that passed by at the end of the track are all from that moment. And I've it felt like it was exactly the structure of the song, but it must have been like seven or eight minutes long. But I just kind of went, oh, cut, 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 you know, in terms of how I might want that song to be. Um, but there was definitely hide and seek, like the words hide and seek was in there. There was a lot on my mind around this particular subject, which I don't talk about. Um, and that feeling was definitely within the recording and this kind of visualizing of what I wanted the song to be. And it was quite strange because I'd never used a harmonizer before and it was deeply fulfilling to be able to just play lots of chords, a bit like that feeling of, oh, wow, um, that's what a computer does. You can just type in and you can hear it straight back without having to record it all um, it, with real instruments. So it's like, oh, wow, I can just sing harmonies of myself. Great. I don't have to record them and make sure they're all in tune and in time. And it was quite pleasing. Um, so as I was doing it, I was kind of like, I was kind of outside of myself, almost looking at myself. Not obviously, but I felt like there was this person singing my voice and I was almost jamming with myself. Um, so when I make those decisions around the harmonies and where I go melodically, it was just, it was like I was jamming. So with another person because my harmonies were there and because the way that the, it was just like a preset four note polyphony thing within the Digitech um, that I just chose a, a scene that sounded nice. Right. And then... But because it was four note polyphony, so if I was probably playing, maybe I didn't even f fully think about it. So I was just like playing whatever chords. So it um, was randomly it selecting was... the voicing of those four notes as well. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And as it did, then, you know, the musician in me was like responding in certain ways around how the melody changes. So when it goes into the, the really annoying high note in the second chorus, which I hardly ever get, um, it was because I was reacting to the inversions that were getting higher and higher. Um, in the uh, with the, the choice of notes in the harmonizer, so yeah, so that's how it happened. So it's, um, there is a sort of it's interesting. You were talking earlier about AI, and there is a, that. I mean, this is very far from AI, but it's still algorithmically based yeah. decisions were made yeah. on your behalf. Yeah, I'm. That is exactly the bit of AI and music that I'm excited about. Is that this concept that you could um, that your kind of AI version of your musical self could be trained on your every, you know, thought and decision in chords and it could be constantly churning it up and kind of creating a bank of what Imogen would be doing at any one point. And so that if then I kind of walk into a studio, especially as a solo artist, you're like, hmm, what should I do today? And you can set Imogen AI off and off she goes, do, 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 do. And you're like, oh, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that a bit further because I'm a human and I can think beyond the box. Um, because I, you're only learning off what I'm, what, what I'm right. inve inventing. 
in my head. So they're always it's always going to be one step behind. And as a result, will I get you know will I become even more creative and even more you know kind of white broaden my horizons because I'm being challenged by myself all the time. Um, so quite I'm excited about that. I'm excited that you could also do the exact opposite. You could have a um, you could understand what your your tendencies are. Um, and many of us do get into that, like, oh, that just sounds like the last song that I just, oh, that, I'm just always using the same invert. I'm just always using the same kind of arpeggiated twinkly sounds in my, in my songs. I do that so often. Um, so by being presented that, I'm going, well, this is you. This is what you do 90% of the time or 30% or 53% of the time. Or you always choose four for like 78% of the time. You need to do more songs in 17, three. I don't know if that's the thing. Um, so by understanding your tendencies, you can reverse them and you can reinvent yourself. You can go, okay, what's the opposite of that? What do I do least? What's not and, me? Yes. What's not me? And how do I create me in that space? Exactly. So that would be really cool. I would love that. Cause then, it could be really cool. Yeah. There is a danger, though, that we could... I mean, everybody remembers the Microsoft paperclip, right? Just got to no. stay... Do you not Do you not remember that... If you used any Microsoft products in the probably late 80s, early 90s, there was... Yeah. The help system was a little animated, friendly paperclip oh, okay. with boggly uh, eyes that uh, everybody used to almost throw yeah. their computer out of the window every time it showed up. <laughs> You've got to make sure that it's not that yes. kind of thing. Yeah. No, of course, of course. Yeah, I don't know how it would manifest itself. But the idea, like, you know, your Fitbit watch or whatever, teaching you you're not getting enough sleep or you're not, um, you, you know, you need to do more fitness in the day. For the, the, there's something about this personal assistant version of yourself in however way that manifests that can help you be the better you that you want to be. Well, want yeah, to help it, you get... I, I get, and it also comes back to what you were talking about earlier, which is the way that you've set up um, your, your, the, the idea of the digital passport. I mean, essentially, you mm. know, AI could. I'm in the studio. I kind of don't want to be an IT guy or gal. I want to just be creative, please. Can somebody else handle all of that, or something else handle that? I'll just have a look mm -hmm. at it, make sure it's all right, and then we can go go. Yeah, yeah. That'd and back nice. up, and all of the stuff that you know, because we generate so much data, especially you know in the digital recording mm -hmm. studio. I mean, thank God you're mm -hmm. not doing just video. Imagine the amount of data mm -hmm. you'd have then have to back. I mean, I know you do a lot of video as well, but I mean, it's a yeah. nightmare. Just all of that stuff. Yeah, actually, that's one. That's a thing that I might start to get interested in. Is I've um, been talking to a few companies about what happens to all the stuff that you don't use in your studio that you spent like hours and hours making that beautiful sound that's so great and that then you realize that actually that's the one sound that just makes everything not work in the song and you have to take it out and you're loath to take it out but you have to take it out and at the end of the session you've got like 80 percent of the stuff recording that you didn't use and 20 percent that you did if you're lucky that's probably quite a high ratio um so anyway so you can say like um you know when you kind of slim down your file or whatever, you can take all files and put that into a slimline session. And then all of your unused files just get stuck there and you never find them again, you never see them again, all that work. But if there was a way that your a service or, a, or a, some kind of app or something could extract that data that you're not using, you could take away vocal takes, obviously, because you don't want that hanging around, um, of the same song. But things which were different enough to the stuff that's on the record, so it's not just a copy of that or like a you know, um, one kick less or something, but right. it's significantly different to the other stuff that could then populate into an unused music folder and categorize it in terms of timbre, tempo, um, key, key signature, all that stuff, so that you can have all your unused content and it would say trumpet, whatever, how you've described it, but basically also how it describes it, it's bendy or whatever it might be, yeah. um, atonal. And then uh, then you could use that to either say, I want to use that, I want to keep that in my stuff because I, I need to have something to come back to next time I want to make a piece of music, I've got somewhere to go. Like, I'm going to go and have a look at my scrap yard, you know, uh, scrapping area. Or you could tick it to get used by somebody that could upload it to Splice or something like uh, that. Yeah, okay. Or Skio. Um, uh, and maybe that kind of repopulate, um, remarket your old stuff for somebody else's you know one person's trash is another person's treasure or whatever um so i think there's something in that to help us organize our um the time that we spent on things and created nice things to kind of repackage them for further use which would 
be very. I suppose so. You could also have the disproportionate amount of from the file creation to the last file modified <laughs> period when it goes. Yeah. You, this is sixteen yeah. hours. This must have some value in it somewhere. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's an interesting yeah. idea. Yeah, I, I mean. And all of that stuff, I mean, it, it kind of goes back to the, the, that terrible news uh, uh, that's been discovered about all the universal tapes of all of the, 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 the outtakes mm. and whatnot that went up in the smoke. You know, I mean, the, 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 yeah. the, whatever it is that it was stored on, the Sheryl Crow stuff. And the, yeah. I mean, there's tons and tons and tons of it. I mean, there is a there is a responsibility as an artist, a creative person to kind of not uh, to make decisions, which is like, this is good. This is bad. So this is what mm. we're going to use. But also. Is there a responsibility to keep that stuff for, that you didn't choose at the time for posterity? Mm. Yeah, I mean, my previously, I, I've just like, well, I didn't use it. It's rubbish. It's going away. I never, I don't, I don't care about it. And every time I start a new session, I never ever use anything from another session. I'm just start from scratch, and that's why I'm like, oh, I'm learning it all over again because I don't start with anything. Um, but that kind of yeah, which also is good, but just to be able to go, oh, well, what was something that I had also previously tried out? Because with Ableton, it's so easy to just like drag something in and, you know, t pick it, yeah. turn it up or down, tempo or key or whatever. It's, I mean, I did the whole Harry Potter play in Ableton, which is crazy when you think about it. Um, and uh, it's just, yeah, it's just easy to be able to do that stuff now, now that you have, you know, s systems like Ableton to just quickly drag them in. Um, Anyway, we shall see. But there's something about organisation of data, of creative data, created data. And when you see sites like Skio, uh, sorry, not Skio, um, what did I just call it? Splice? Stripe. Splice. 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 Um, well, it's just other revenue streams. Again, it kind of all comes back to the creative passport. Um, and how can we, you know, be more than some of our parts and bring ourselves together in one place to be able to offer ourselves out more opportunities you may discover that actually you're you're you've got a much better market in um drum loops than you do in ever trying to be uh you know um yeah, a, a, pop for, star. For yeah. a pop star because the level at which you're going to have to become a pop star to actually earn any money out of it from streaming or whatever is just so enormous and unlikely that you might as well have a have a little business um you know using getting your loops out there or your little sounds um, but at the same time, be able to um, fund your creative self um, in your music making. But that doesn't have to be your main income. Hmm. It's just, um, and that's the same. It's like, there's so many other ways to earn music in the industry. Like whether you do some sound recording for someone or you do some arranging well, backing vocals. And you have to, you, you have to do all of those yeah. things. You have to, you, have. you have to diversify yeah. because we all, yeah. you know, it's like, yeah. I mean, I still occasionally get off asked to do sound and it's like well yeah. uh, okay I, I mean you know you yeah. can't say no can you i've yeah, got a yeah. couple more questions to finish up because i know that um you're probably getting close to your your time where you're going to have to dash off and do other other things um music technology what's the last instrument or electronic thing gadget doodah what's it plug in that that kind of got you kind of excited and thinking oh yeah i can't wait to use that on something i can tell you that um for sure um it's tim's endless like beyond anything, what Tim Egg Exile is doing for social music making is amazing. It's like I'm starting to well up um, because what it is, and I'm sure you, you can link back to a, a talk Certainly that you've had sure with Tim about it. Um, so Tim Exile is a dear friend and he came on tour with me. I actually invited him originally on tour with me because I wanted to figure out how he makes music um, as an electronic artist and improvises the way he did with the setup that he had. I was like, when I first heard him play, I was floored. I was like, how could anyone do that? How can anyone just like be at one with their equipment so much in the mm. moment on stage and make it sound that good? How can that be possible? And so I, I was like, how do you do it? And he was like, um, well, I've been, I can't tell you um, at that time. <laughs> but he put, he says he didn't, but it was, maybe it wasn't quite like that. Anyway, I was like, hmm, I'm going to figure a way. So I was like, you want to come on tour with me? And then I can l learn, essentially. Um, anyway, he's all, he's not, he's not like that at all. I'm giving the wrong impression. But I definitely felt like I want to learn more about this technology and what he's doing. And he inspired me to, to make these gloves um, because I was like, you want, you want to do something in the world in a certain way and you've got a clear vision about how you want it to be. 
then just don't wait around for somebody else to do it. Just get on and do it. You know, whether that's a song or some kind of piece for a film that you want to create or whatever it is, just get on and do it if you can. You know, just just go where you're put your money down where your mouth is and just do these things all your money where your mind is. Um, and so anyway, so what he's doing now is he it's all about like being in the moment and just being present and being creative and social. You know, he's a very social creature. And he's not programming um and so endless you, i don't know if you can sign up for it yet but um you basically have a little login in you get and you start um joining in with lots of other people jamming making these tiny mm. little uh, can't remember what they call them um yeah I, i'm no. trying to remember now they're scenes or sketches or uh hold on i can look at it anyway sorry i've only used it like well i have used it quite a lot actually what's good about it is that i've for the first time in very long time i've been like right scouts asleep um i've got 10 minutes i'm just gonna go and start singing into my phone and just join in with all these other people jamming right now and you just get totally hooked and it puts music in the center again because it's just really yeah. accessible and easy to get, get to get going it's not like coming to the studio you've got to drive to the studio because up the studio is miles away from where i am now um and plug in the microphone wait for the thing to turn to heat up make sure all the plugins that you know pro tools has been offline for ages um because of some update thing um and so it just seems like a big thing to do before you get to the point of you know and there's no there's no barrier to entry here you just get in you start you just start making music you post clips when you've done uh, something that you like and then if it doesn't like it it doesn't matter it's gone in five seconds or less um but if somebody likes it they pick up they pick it up and then they continue jamming on that and they add some sound effects or they add a vocal or they add some drums if they're in their own studio. And it's just this amazing thing. It's like a totally new concept for, you know, being creative in the moment with, you know, potentially millions of people. It's, cl it's clever how that's happened because, I mean, online jamming systems, they've tried to make them work for ages. But there's a particularly a non where there's an anon on anonymity, you know, where it's like, can I join mm -hmm. in? Because we're all... <laughs> As you said earlier, you know, you said you sort of felt an imposter. We all, as creative people, generally think yeah. I'm not good enough. I couldn't possibly play with those people unless you kind of went to Berkeley or you're one of those kind of fa fancy <laughs> LA or Nashville musicians who could do anything. The rest yeah. of us kind of go, oh, I don't know. You know, I, I, I'm not sure I could. You know, that that anxiety dream of the one, two, three, four, and you're on stage and you're not. It's not your band. You haven't got any trainers yeah. on. You don't know anything that's going on. It's that, isn't it? So it's yeah. to yeah. make it work. Yeah, impressive. Yeah, he's done and it's you know it's not just obviously something he's created now out of the blue it's life's his life's work about improvising with tech, you know with his software that he's created um mostly in reactor in the past but now he's developed this entirely new engine but it's all of his like the finger and the mouth and all these things that he's mm. developed in this little box at your fingertips so and i was literally like i thought oh, i'll just do 10 minutes and i started getting into it and i was like oh i love that I love that thing that someone's done. I'm just going to play a little bit of piano in. You've got my piano in my flat. Um, record that in, and then somebody, somebody verifying that they think something that you've done is good, like in the moment, is just so amazing. It's such such an amazing feeling of like I've connected with somebody. I don't know who Rat Boy is, but I'm going to continue um, because they like that piece of music. And there's something about this, you know, that it's that community, that communication of. Uh, of something about yourself that somebody else liked and they continued working with it in a and, it, it, and it's not a photo of a cat yeah i mean it's an actual exactly. it's a that's really interesting because i mean that it, it i mean music and creativity is i think very much about the ego i mean with a small e mm. because it's we project okay. all the time don't i mean that's what we're yeah. doing and yeah. in many ways you know what we do when we when we make something and a piece of music goes and or, or, or people love it, it it's verification isn't it you just sort of think oh mm -hmm. i'm i'm not i'm not so much of an imposter i'm not you know you know so it, it, in that instance i'm not trying it with endless but i can see how that would be very addictive actually yeah it is it is very addictive and it just makes you feel like oh i haven't you know as a musician who are deeply like first and foremost i am a musician but i'm not able to be that at the moment because I'm really focused on the creative passport, so I really want to do that. Um, and but to be able to have these little windows back into that bit of me that I feel like it's going to massage it to the point of when I'm ready to make the record, that I'll have felt like I won't just be coming in from scratch. I'll right. have you know, had these evenings jamming with these people, and it's so lovely if anyone wants to check it out because they've got live stream of it and people are jamming all the time. Like probably someone jamming now, um, and it's just amazing to listen like 
I think people will start to have it on their coffee tables or like on their dining tables, listening to it, having a chat, you know, invite, having like a, just having a dinner with friends at your house, but they'll have this in the background instead of, instead of Spotify, instead of whatever, because it's real people jamming right then and there. And you could join in, you know, at the table. But then if somebody does something that you really love, you'd be like, oh my God, that's amazing. You know, that you could send love to that person. Or in the, t in the future, maybe even Tim might, I think he should, like that you should have some way of, thanking them like monetarily thanking somebody it could be a entirely new form of revenue like tip jar yeah 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 i just it's so good it's i hope it just really takes off in a massive way and i have i have, I have to say i did invest um not because i want to earn lots of money but because i absolutely believe in what he's doing and i just want to help him get there it's just fascinating and amazing so well done brilliant Oh, well, I'm yeah. really glad to hear that. Um, uh, yeah. So what's next for you then? I mean, obviously, um, you're working on the Creative Passport. Is that, are there projects coming up? Or are you in the middle of something What's what's um, that you can talk about, obviously? Yeah, there are a few things. Um, the main thing is I've moved into a different place in Hackney, which is a much bigger space. And we're kind of hopefully going to be moving in a lot of the different teams around all the different projects. And maybe the, the Mimi guys might come in there for a bit so that we can all be under one roof. Um, and so the Creative Passport team, the Mimi team maybe, um, and the label, and there's also something around a community arts project here in the garden of this house um, to, to maybe make something there too, focusing in VR, around social and VR um, and identity, a bit of research into the physical identity and the digital identity and when they cross and how to take one into the other and how to keep it private and all that stuff. Um, potentially some stuff with Berkeley in the future um, that, that, that might have happened recently. Um, they gave me an honorary doctorate. Wow. Um, um, but really we, we would love to develop the Creative Passport with, you know, a kind of under the under the umbrella of education you can test things out that are a little bit sometimes controversial in the commercial space um just to see how things go um in terms of you know publishing songs and what kind of data and how you do that and how do you agree to certain splits and who do you let people what publishers and information do you let let go and so it's a it could become a, a really cool hotbed of experimentation um for creative passport so we'll see what happens there as usual i'm telling too much than i should um but i th i believe that when you say things out loud um it's more likely that they happen um <laughs> that's well, why they I get a certain like, energy as well don't they? they get us they and i i get the feeling you'll kind of respond very well to to, to energy that's going in the right direction and it, it all kind of works in the right i mean it sounds like you're you know you're basically shaping or uh, uh, working on shaping the future of digital uh music or just music generally and that is something that i think is very important because it's something that's been very neglected it's been so commodified recently that we it's the value of it has been reduced to to like you know a water bill or electricity bill you know and it's mm. yeah, it just it, it's not working right yet yeah i think it's a i think that the the streaming and digital space is a type is a piece of the future for musicians but it's not the whole and at the moment you know 90 percent of the innovation uh is very slow innovation is around that is that around that um digital distribution of music um but it's so limited because the only data that they have is the data that comes from the labels um and in order to kind of develop and innovate in that space you need to you need to have licenses from the labels in advance so ch massive chunks of money enable to have the songs to put onto the cert to make your service which means you have to have all this vc money up front which means it already they're on the back foot musicians are already on the back foot by those services having to pay these huge amounts of money to the labels in the beginning so we just need to make it make sense for us we need to make it possible that in the future the musicians and their songs can be independent still work with labels because they're still going to have you know loads of things that they can do and you know labeled services and all kinds of things but to be able to have this spread um and i think the minute that you see like millions of music makers hopefully um this is a non-profit by the way and even if it doesn't happen something i hope will happen like this where the individual music maker is an integrated part of the whole of the music industry creating this massive handshake across the world verifying music maker to music maker it being verified to to change to author to augment data about the song um, but also to beam out information that's relevant to that person at that time. So your biography gets uploaded to all of the music sites 
when you change something from your creative passport, so one point into everything else, um, and that people pay you for the data that's useful to them. So if a service is using your inspiration data, like who who inspires me as a musician, I would put in there um, Tim Exile, I'd put in there Zoe Keating, I'd put in there Guy Sigsworth, and some of the, and John Hopkins, I love John Hopkins, um, and Leo Abraham, I love Leo Abraham. Anyway, all these people <laughs> would be, if you went onto a service like Spotify and you were like, hmm, I'm going to click on Imogen Heap Inspiration. That's going to be how I discover new music today. Mm. What Im what music does Imogen get inspired by? And you would discover this, have a, this trail into all kinds of other musicians that you would never yeah. have another way, another discovery point. So it's just a way, again, an opportunity to show the services how they can be, how they can give more to their, you know, to the listeners. Um, but by paying us potentially for our data that helps them keep the listeners on their service. So there's all kinds of, new ways that we could um, be useful to the music industry and get paid. I mean, we're talking about tiny amounts in, in terms of that type of data, but we're talking about tiny amounts in terms of streaming anyway. But where, it's, really where the magic happens... At least it's something, happens, yeah. At least it's something. Yeah. But the magic happens in the discoverability of the big, you know, offers of a private show here or going to do a talk over there or giving a kid's workshop or whatever it is that you're good at um, or a bit of coding, being able to... And, and in that, be able to see the line of work in your a trail of you know your history about what you do so that somebody can get a picture of you and go that person is going to be that right for this hundred thousand um so <laughs> obviously the mimu gloves a very big part of uh, what you've been working on as well can we have a look at that um so these are the old gloves but we've just figured a way to you can't really see them um figured out we've got we've got a manufacturing process now and we have sold um you know our first kind of few pairs uh, as the uh, uh, you know uh, we haven't really sold any since few years ago where we handmade them but we discovered that there was so much reach out there people really wanting these gloves that we needed to find a way to um you know create a create a, a possibility for musicians out there who wanted to make music in the way that you can with the gloves so we've done that um and they're now you know available to buy we've done our first round um and our next round will be i think opening august or september so we're pretty excited about that but beyond that wait there um I just did something recently for CBeebies. Um, um, so these are the Mini Mew. UK, UK Children's Television. Oh, wow. Yeah. These Mi are the Mini Mew. And um, you can build it and code it yourself. You can just chop you chop up. The only thing that's not included in the pack is the um, scissors. <laughs> Everything else is included. Um, and it's just got a little micro bit uh, in here. Uh, if you're familiar with the micro bit. Right. Got it. Um, and a speaker that's in there, um, and it's got a battery. Um, and basically it's got pitch, uh, an accelerometer, um, pitch, accelerometer, and roll. And then you can code the um, what you want the gloves to do uh, on a little web app. Um, and it's really, really fun if you've got any kids, like kind of six plus, to get into um, coding with their, you know, get their ideas going. And, and, beyond, and soon, um, you're going to be able to use these with our soft software called Glover, which is how the gloves um, speak to Ableton or whatever music software you use, or Macs or whatever you want to use, um, so that you can you can use the incredibly powerful um, kind of mapping uh, potentials of however whatever you want to do with your glove. Um, and easily map it to whatever software you want to use. Because um, I'm so just coming back, looking at the, uh, I've watched a couple of your videos with the, where you're doing the gesture stuff, and it's the nuance is astonishing. I mean, it really is. You know, I don't know how many potential gestures there are in inside of the the way you do it. But I mean, do you are, are you are you constantly thinking of a vi of a, of a uh, physical language that is has consistency, sort of, so that you're not kind of going, oh, that's a bit too close to delete all, or you just see what I mean? Uh, yeah, yeah, it has emerged like that. Um, the more you work with the gloves, the more, like any language, you 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 kind of figure out how you say things without thinking about them. Um, so I've now got my my kind of gestural language of making music around mainly around vocal effects is. Um, you know, I, I have like nine, no, I have eight postures that I, sometimes nine postures that I use. So there's got, we've got fist, puppet hand, one finger point, open hand, uh, one finger point, two finger point, secret finger, T finger and rock sign and, puppet, and pinch as well. Um, so those, the combination of those with the different axes of movement. So we've got pitch, 
uh, roll and your with the, the min, with the mean mu gloves, not with the mini mu. Um, and then you've got accelerometer peaks, which you can set the thresholds for. Um, so however hard or however, um, in whatever zone, you've got up, down, left, right, back, forward as well. Um, and then combinations of left and right, both together, creates a qualifier to do a thing. Um, so the possibilities are literally endless. Like you get, you can get lost. And then if you combine that with other things that you might want to interface with, so you might want to have a leap motion, so you're using your gloves, but when you pass your hand over the leap motion at this point, maybe it does a thing. Um, or you can use it with a Connect. Well, they don't make Connects anymore, but I used to use a Connect. Um, or your iPhone. We've got something coming out for the iPhone as well. Mm. Um, so there's all kinds of like different interfaces or different gloves even. Uh, we've got... A, Different other gloves, like data gloves, which are nowhere near as good, but they're a lot cheaper, um, which you can kind of get your hands stuck into Glover and then hopefully want to buy a pair of gloves because they're way better. Um, but the, the magic is really in that, um, in that software that the guys have developed um, and we've developed in performance mode and figured out, you know, how do you get from one song to another without pressing loads of keys and going in and out of different software um, how do you make it super easy to do that? How do you present the information you need in the way you need it? Um, and so you can copy and paste things super easily. You can bring sessions together really quickly. Um, so yeah, I have a little language. So this, for instance, Secret Finger um, activates my reverb. Um, so I have a little, I do that. And then when I'm there, it's now latched onto my, um, you know, my uh, wet versus dry vocal reverb. Um, and it will, uh, as I do this, it will go to 100% or whatever percent I've set it. Ah, and, then back. Okay. and then when I unlatch it, it goes back to a certain could whatever be the 20 base level. Yeah, yeah. Or zero yeah. or whatever you want. And then, but and if I do that, then generally I'm uh, either reversing my voice, which I got off Team Exile, <laughs> um, or I'm I'm like doing this da -da -da, with my right hand and then reversing that. I do that a lot. Um, but I also just record my voice now, just like da da da, and then release my voice. And then I can pan it left and right. I can, there's so many things. But people start to have their own gestural language. But actually, we found that a lot of musicians, because it's kind of human nature, that that's obviously louder, you know, than yeah. that. You wouldn't put louder down there. We well, might do, just be different or I don't know. But that doesn't feel natural. It's like, that's louder, that's quite, that's bigger, that's smaller. Yeah. You know, this is open, this is closed filter. You know, it's like, it just feels natural. So it tends to be that people gravitate to these kind of same kind of, you know, gestures and postures. And I think that we will start to see a gestural language emerge, not just in music, but across all the different ways that we interface with the computer. And as we do, we'll fine tune things in to start to create standardization so that when we do start to use a different thing, it, it will become second nature. Oh, that's how you copy and paste and, or whatever. Or that's yeah. how you delete, whatever it might be. And then we start to do that. People will start to bring that into their glove system or vice versa. So, yeah, it's very exciting to be at the cusp of all of that. Um, and... It feels amazing to be on stage. This tour really just, that was one of the joys of this tour, to be honest, was after nine years of developing these gloves with this team now, um, got it to the point where you can feel totally confident on stage that you've got everything you need at your fingertips and you can stand in front of the crowd and be, you know, looping, harmonising, playing different sounds, bringing in samples, playing bass lines without having to go back to the computer at any point and look at the screen you know, or do something that feels quite, I mean, I still use a fader and sometimes a button on, you know, they've also got buttons by the way, and they've got lights for feedback and vibration motors. Um, so you could, you could still go back and obviously use that. If you're playing the piano and you just want to raise a level or something, you just use a fader on the, on the piano if you're there. But if you don't need to use anything at that particular point, why should you as a human go to that machine and do a thing when you can just do it with a gesture? So it's really starting to come together um, now with, with the live shows. Well, it has come together fully. And we have got a tour coming up in the UK second week of November. To yeah, the I saw fourth. that. Details um, at imogenheap.com, so, folks. Yes. Right, yeah. Come to see us. Um, so it's very exciting. And, um, yeah, we're happy that after all these years of people asking that we finally have a thing that they can get their hands on and get going. Yeah. That's brilliant, brilliant. Imogen, thank you so much for talking to us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah. Uh, and I thank wish you. you all the best in all your m multiple endeavours. Thank you, Nick. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you.